All right, um, I'm David Pat. We are talking today about the book of Micah, and we're talking about what is required for Christians. Um, by show of hands, raise your hand if you actually read the book of Micah. Raise your hand. Okay, about half. Okay, that's actually more than I thought. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, Micah, back in, in back when we used paper Bibles, it's in the middle of your Bible. All right, now in your app, it's in like the middle of the list. Okay. Um, Old Testament is actually really easy. A lot of it is actually chronological. All right, so when we get to the book of Micah, this is the last period. It's called the period of the prophets. The last period before the New Testament, before Jesus comes. So, the book of Micah, to set it up, Micah is a prophet, okay? Um, he is of what ethnicity? Jewish. <laughs> there was one time I spoke at, I spoke at a youth group, and I'm like, what ethnicity is he? And someone's like, Chinese. I'm like, is this because I'm Chinese? <laughs> All right. um, Micah being Jewish is actually really important. Okay? Because what this book, the issues it deals with, it has to deal with the nation of Israel. Right? The nation of Israel, it's actually two kingdoms. And the, but the people of God, the people of, they're descended from Abraham. So, in the book of Micah, what is happening? We are looking at about 700 BC, right? And why is, that, why is that date important? When you think of ancient Israel, and if you go to Israel today or Jerusalem today, um, there is one person you're going to see over and over and over again, and that's actually Christians and Orthodox Jews all agree on. It was a great person, King David. Right? That's the one we all have agreement on, King David. Because when you look at Jerusalem today, a lot of the stuff that's like glorious and awesome is basically from King David and then his son Solomon, who actually expanded the empire. But King David was the greatest because he is the high priest, actually a good priest. He was actually a good king, and he was a prophet. And then from that point on, it pretty much goes down. <laughs> okay? So when we get to the point of Micah, what's happening now? Well, now you're a couple hundred years removed from David and Solomon. And so now people are just doing their own thing, not being good people. And they've forgotten what it's like to be the people of God. So Micah, being a prophet, he's calling people back to God. He's saying, he's saying to people, what does it mean, what is required for you to be the people of God? And now does we call that Christians. So what is required for you? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. When a prophet says this, when it's in the Bible, it tells you that something's not happening, right? What is good? What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Why is, it, why is the word required in there? All right, our English translation of the Hebrew. All right, why, does it, why is that there? It's because God made a covenant, a promise with his people. First, to Abraham, I'll make you a nation. Then to Moses, I'll take you into this new land. And then under David, I'll make you a kingdom. If what? If you are faithful. If you are faithful, then I'll protect you from your enemies, and it will, it will go well with you. And under King David, they did that. Solomon maybe a little less so. And then a couple hundred years after, they did not do that at all. And so God is calling them back to this promise. What do I require of you? To act justly. Right? As a person of God, to always act justly. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Here's a, here's a sneak peek. Now that we're thousands of years later, they did not do that. <laughs> okay? Here's a, a scene of relief. So both archaeology and what we know in the Bible kind of support what's happening this time. What ends up happening is they are disobedient and they go into exile. There's two kingdoms. First, the northern kingdom goes into exile to Assyria, and then the southern kingdom basically falls to Babylon afterwards. The promises of God and the covenants of God are a serious thing. The promises of God and the covenants of God are a serious thing. To the Jewish people, God made this promise. If you are faithful, I will protect you from your enemies. Right? Like, I will take you through the desert under the time of Moses. And when, when King David rose up, he was not the most powerful king. 
There have always been giant empires around Israel. That's always been true. Egypt has always been like, like a massive empire. Some Assyrian, Babylonian, something, something has always been powerful to their east. Right? They've always been this small nation sandwiched to an empire. And God says to them, if you are faithful, do not worry about your army. I will protect you. Do not worry about droughts. Do not worry about any of that stuff. I will, I will just take care of you. And they did not do that. Now, the, the book of Micah is written during that time, but most Christians will read it afterwards. Right? So God intends for us to look at this book to see what happens to his people and to learn from it. So that's what we're going to do today. Let's focus on this first part. So God's speaking to us now. He says this to us. You have to act justly. Alright? You have to act justly. What does that mean? Real easy. In the, in the time of Micah, and you look at the period of, especially David and Solomon, to act justly was number one, don't worship false gods. Don't put your hope, don't put your esteem, don't talk about it with like great admonishment. Like these things that are like made of wood, that are fake. And take care of the poor in your land. To take care of the poor in your land. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of, those two things actually are kind of related, right? Because to celebrate the gods of the land, like Baal and stuff like that, leads you into prostitution, leads you into sac human sacrifice in some cases, all right? And so to act justly is to keep yourself stained from like prostitution and like killing children and stuff like that. And the opposite end then what? If we value life, then we do what? We value the old, we value the young, and we value the weak. So to act justly is to keep yourself away from these bad things and the flip side is to push yourself towards these good things. To act justly. This is, this is true for Micah back in 700 BC, and it's still true to us today. I'm going to be talking a little about uh, my, own, my own journey um, as I encounter God and as I go through my life. And a big thing that happened to me for me this year, I went to Greece. All right. um, some of you guys know I'm a bodybuilder. Um, this, this summer, I just came back in June, I had the privilege to go to Greece uh, for the World Championships. Um, some of you guys know me for a while, so you guys know I've been doing bodybuilding for a while. Uh, this year was completely different because I'm a father now, and so I prepped for this trip while being a father, and um, it was great. <laughs> like, it was nuts. Like waking up at 5 a.m., working out, coming home tired already, and then Jeremiah wakes up, and I'm like, oh man, here we go. <laughs> And like I'm going until like Jeremiah falls asleep, right? So I'm like, all right, this, this, it's only like this for like five months, <laughs> which is a long time. Um, but then I, I had a chance to compete at the World Championships, and um, you know what's tough for myself, and maybe for a lot of you, I think in my mind, hard work, the result of that is just achievement, right? Like, in my mind, the way I was raised is like, you work super hard, and at the end, you get to brag about all the achievements you have. Um, as, as a parent, I think a lot about the lessons that I've learned, and I'm kind of push, pushing towards my kid now. When, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I went to the CIF playoffs for, for wrestling, or as a sophomore. And I, I, went, I went to the playoffs, and I got destroyed, because I was like 13 years old in the playoffs. And I remember coming home, and I told my mom, like, hey, I went to the playoffs as a sophomore. And she's like, what, you didn't win the state championship? And I was like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, you didn't win. Like, you, you just went, right? And I was like, what's happening right now? <laughs> right? Like, I'm 13 years old. Like, I just want to, like, connect with you and celebrate with you. And she's like, well, what's so great about this? You know, and so, and so from a very early age, like, I started to, to equate like happiness and achievement as being the end goal for all these things, right? You work hard and it's only really fun if you achieve your goal. I had a chance to go to Greece this year and I didn't do well, all right? Um, one of the scariest things about sports, right, is that you can personally do well and not have a good result. Um, so I was personally really happy. I was personally, I was, this, this is the biggest I've ever been and the lowest body fat I've ever been. 
I love being a dad, right? So I'm like, yes, this is awesome. And I go up and I go to the show, and this is why it's the World Championships. I like twist like from the bottom. And a part of me was like, that I, I wasted a year. I wasted a year of my life. Because I worked hard towards this goal, and I didn't have achievement come out at the end of it. God calls me to act justly. To live justly. And it was, it was after the show, you know, I had, I had a chance to sit there with like, you know, my friends and stuff who were there, and my, my teammates. Um, what's great about these giant shows is that you get to see all your friends from all over the world, right? It's like the one time a year you guys can all come together. And I was just sitting with my friends, and I was thinking to myself, like, is this losing? Like, to be surrounded by people I care about, to be in the sport that I care about, is this losing? To be in Greece. The day after we were at the beach and stuff, right? That's like, is this losing? For me, I had to kind of recalibrate my mind a little bit. And now that I'm a dad, I think a lot about what I'm teaching my son Jeremiah. What is doing right? Is achievement doing right? Is accolades and awards, the more we have, are we therefore more right, more just, more like worthy of acclaim? An acclamation, right? See, one of the things I really worry about, especially with people like us in this room, is that we start to equate the blessings of God with just achievement. And with just what the world says. That's always been true, guys. Alright? Taking it back to Micah. Why, why does it, Micah say, act justly? Alright? Because one of the problems Israel had after pretty much David is they would keep allying themselves with what? World powers. World powers that were actually not Christian, not the people of God, obviously, because only one people of God. So they kept allying themselves with like wow. Egypt or Syria or like Babylon, like in different factions. And for them, it's like, well, if I'm, if I'm allied with them, look how good we look. They kept chasing the security and satisfaction in the world, and they kept being betrayed by it. They kept trying to play the game, the game of politics, the game of thrones. And the only way to win is to not play this game. All right? And they kept playing this game, and they're like, you know what, if we keep out aligning ourselves with successful countries around us, then we'll be successful too. That's not true. That's something I've experienced in my own life too. In my own life, if I, if I determine my success only by awards, only by what people say of me, I'm never going to be happy. And here's what's hard, all right? I think a lot of you guys know this, all right? Things I'm saying, I think you guys know this. But here's the hard part I challenge you to. Be a good person, be a just and righteous person, even when the circumstances are not in your favor. And this is the impossible thing now. Be a just and righteous person, even when the circumstances are not in your favor. That's something that the Holy Spirit has to do in your life. Meaning what? It's really easy to be a super Christian and a person of God under, under David's kingdom. Because he, he was a good king. The enemies were, did not invade Israel. <laughs> right? So you didn't have to worry about foreign powers. And you didn't like die of starvation and stuff like that under David. And so you're like, oh, I'll be a good person now. Because life is easy. And then as, as the kingdom spirals down, now be a good person. Now follow God when you're being invaded. Now follow God when you have no leader. Sorry. Follow God when we have no leader. And they couldn't do that. And for, all, for a lot of us, that's very common to us, right? Follow God when it's not as hard at work. That's hard. Follow God after you got in a fight with your wife. That's hard. Follow God when someone in your family is sick. And to have faith in God and to trust and say God is good. When, when times are hard. With man, it's impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. But that's what God's, God's calling us to do. It's to follow God in the hard times. And I do believe the longer you're a Christian, I think the challenges get bigger and bigger. And I think the reason why that happens is so that you can truly see God. Because you don't really see God in the super easy times, because you're kind of just coasting. But I think in those hard times is when you really truly see God.
God says this to us. Love mercy. Why? Why love mercy specifically? And why is this so unique to Christians? More than any other religion in the world, why love mercy? It's because when you experience that mercy, is when you experience God rescuing you in your hardest of times, you realize to be a person of God, to be a reflection of who God is, is to be there when people need you the most. Because your experience of God is this. When I was really down and out, God was there for me. So then you start learning. So then what is the nature of God's love? Is God's love most present when times are good? No, we know that God's love is most present when everything is terrible. So God said to these two people, there will always be widows in your land. There will always be orphans in your land. There will always be those who are poor in your land. Therefore, to what? Love, mercy. You can identify, I don't care how rich you are, you can identify with someone who's suffering through things. I don't care how successful you are, I don't care how awesome you are, right? You can still identify with those who are in pain. So then do this, love mercy. In the same way that you as a Christian experience mercy, love it. Live your life for mercy. If you, if you really think about it in your life, you are not actually most impressed or most happy when you achieve or have comfort and security. You are actually most happy when you are loved. And especially that love feels more meaningful when you go through hard times. Okay? So if your experience of God is love in those hard times, then extend it to others. Because it's hard to be around Jesus all the time and not do what Jesus does. Right? It's hard to be with Jesus every single day and not do what he does. For myself, after Budapest, or uh, after Greece, we actually went to Budapest. All right, this is one of the blessings of being a bodybuilder. You get to travel with your teammates and stuff. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I was able to go to Budapest is because one of my teammates in bodybuilding, she's Hungarian. So her and her fiance um, welcomed us in Hungary and connected us with this orphanage. Um, this is actually a big blessing. I talked to my other missionary friends in, in Budapest and they cannot connect with orphanages. I've, I've tried. Like they keep telling me like, hey, I don't speak Hungarian. They don't return my phone calls. <laughs> Right? Um, but when a bodybuilder calls you, you call back. <laughs> so we got connected with this orphanage. Uh, we've been there actually a couple times now. And, uh, you know, I love serving orphans, um, and probably because I start to realize new things about um, what they're going through every day. I think this kind of blew my mind. But if I say this out loud, you might think and realize that this is like not super, like, oh my gosh. You know, most orphans, their parents are alive. You ever think about that? Most orphans in the world, their parents are alive. Or, if their mom and dad's not alive, they have some family members who are alive. Right? Then why are they in an orphanage? Does that blow your mind? Think about that. There are kids, and some of these kids have been here for years and years. Alright, this is a child home. I don't call it an orphanage, but it's an orphanage because when you spend years and years there, it's an orphanage. They grew up with strangers and other kids that are not related to them because no one in their family wants them. I think, I think this year, I think being a dad, it makes me look at it a different way. I think one of the mistakes we make is that we think that a lot of these kids are orphaned because of tragedy. Right? That, that's why I, I, I thought I saw it in China. Like, a lot, of, a lot of the Chinese orphans are poverty orphans. So they, they grow up in a, in a poor, you know, poor village and stuff like that. And the family's poor, they give them up, so the family can't raise them. Or the one child policy, and so they have a kid with a disability, and so they're abandoned. And then one thing I, I saw in Budapest, I realized like, the conditions are actually very different. The conditions are that a lot of them families get pregnant when they, did, when they did, didn't want a kid and they didn't want to have an abortion, so that's good. Um, a lot of kids are surrendered because their families are addicted to drugs or to domestic violence or something like that. But on top of that then, other members of the family don't want these kids. They don't take them in. 
So what then is the problem really? See, in China, I thought it was just poverty. I thought it was just special needs. It's not, it's not just that. Love and mercy. I think for me, the longer I do ministry, I get mad at Christians all the time, right? Because I see Christian leaders and stuff do bad things. Um, and then I visit like an orphanage, you know, um, I do Special Olympics and Paralympics and stuff like that. And I realize it's almost all Christians. When you look at those who adopt, it's almost all Christians. When you look at those with special, who work special needs, who work with like, substance abuse and stuff like that, it's like so many Christians. And I wonder why that is. Right? Why, why is it that when the world, when the world turns its back on people when they're down and out, right, when they're addicted to heroin, alcohol, stuff like that, why is it when the world turns its face away, why do Christians stay? And that's around the world. That's not an American thing. That's an African, that's an Asian, that's a South American thing. Why is it that Christians do that? Micah 6 eight. God requires us to love mercy. It was actually kind of funny. Um, we, went, we went to this orphanage, and um, we rolled up, and it was like myself and, and my friend Agatha was there. Um, she's a bodybuilder. Her fiance is a bodybuilder. And as we roll up, we're like buff and stuff. And they're looking at us, they're like, why are you here? <laughs> right? I think in their mind, they're like, this looks, looks like a weird group. Because we had like Chinese Americans and Hungarians. And then, like, three of us are, like, really buff. <laughs> They're like, how did, you, how did this team form? <laughs> right? Um, and so we, I had to go through the whole steal of all, like, my ministry and stuff like that. I met Agatha. It is a strange thing. I think in the different ways that a lot of Christians get into mercy ministry and missions, um, it's kind of strange. So my encouragement to a church like this, there's not one path for you guys. There's not one path to what it looks like to do nonprofit work, to do missions, to do church ministry. There is a lot of ways to get there. I think my encouragement to you guys, ask. Ask God for how your skill set can be used for the kingdom of God. Ask God for why your specific talents and hobbies and interests can be used to express mercy and love to those who need it the most. When I live with my coworkers worldwide, I realize that most of us have very different backgrounds. I see guys who are engineers, I see guys who are lawyers, I see guys who are just artists and videographers and stuff like that. A lot of Christian coffee shops, I don't know why, okay? <laughs> if you guys want to open a coffee shop, talk to me. <laughs> there's a lot of those, okay? But there's not one way to do ministry, not one way to express mercy. So let's ask God, right? The biggest thing I encourage you guys is not to work harder. And ask that question, God, how do I express mercy to others? And to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with your God. Why? Why is this in here? The context of Micah 6 8, the context of this, Israel is not a world power. If you were born in Israel, Northern Kingdom, or Southern Kingdom, you have never been on top of the world. So what, what arrogance do you have? I think the arrogance that we have is personal arrogance. It's the personal arrogance of saying, our future will be this. My future will be this. I will store up treasures for myself or education for myself, and I will go live this life. And you start to point out all these goals you have in life, and like, my family will be amazing, and all this stuff. And God is saying to you this, walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly. Meaning what? Do not determine your own future. I'll say it again. Do not determine your own future. There's a reason why Christians meet all the time. Because we are constantly asking God and each other for affirmation and encouragement for the things that we are about to do. Always be open to correction. The gift I want to extend to you today is actually repentance. The gift I extend to you today is a chance to turn your life around, to make changes in your life. To walk humbly with God is to say that the path that I have my life on, it's not set. 
I will allow God, I will allow the people of God to make small corrections to that. And that's hard, right? Because some people give bad advice. Okay. But it's the attitude of saying, like, I don't have it all figured out. Not everything in my education, not everything in my wealth, not everything in my family is all set in stone. I will do this day by day. My right? Bible said, do not worry about tomorrow, for today has enough troubles of its own. Walking humbly with God is saying, you know what? Every day I'm going to ask God, what do you want from me today? As I continue to learn, as I continue to grow, change my plans. Change my plans so that, you know what, I can be used by you. From what I've seen my coworkers worldwide, God changes plans. <laughs> um, very few friends I have in mission work and ministry work said, like, hey, when I was 17 years old, I wanted to do this. <laughs> I wanted to plant churches. Like, I wanted to be a gospel radio ministry, da, da, da. Almost everyone. They point to a story in their life. They point to something, a, a message they heard, a friend invited them to something, a person they worked under, and then their plans changed. So what do I see that in the commonality? They walked humbly with God. And said, God, I'm not arrogant enough at 17, at 25, at 35, at 45, to say, my life is set. <laughs> like, don't, don't talk to me. I got this. <laughs> In the, in the stories of my coworkers, I hear, every day I woke up and I ask God, what's next? Half of the people we send out as missionaries from OMF are, are, are over 50 years old. <laughs> Think about that. Half the missionaries we send are over 50 years old. So we have a bunch of 20 year olds and a bunch of like 60 year olds <laughs> going out to the mission field. So 20 makes sense, right? You're asking God, like, what do I do in my career? But 50 also makes sense because these are faithful Christians asking God, now that my kids are grown, now I'm going to do. That's walking humbly with God. Is allowing God, like, hey, I've been on the wrong path. And God doesn't kill me for that, right? Like, some of you guys think, like, God's like, oh my gosh, I told you, you're a bad person. Like, God corrects you to love you, to care for you. All right, as a father, I don't mess with Jeremiah. Like, see, I told you, you're a baby. You always do bad things. <laughs> Right? Like, I don't do that to Jeremiah. I'm like, okay, Jeremiah, you're one years old. Like, you don't know things. All right? Like, this is hot. Don't touch it. Right? Don't eat that. That's dirt. <laughs> like, I'm not just going to mess with him. Right? It's like, see? I, I knew you would eat dirt. Like, told you so. Like, I'm doing that. Like, don't eat dirt. <laughs> like, in like two seconds, you're going to regret eating dirt. <laughs> God is a better father than I am. <laughs> He's trying to correct you for your own good. He's to help you, to love you. When I, when I first started my own journey, right, um, I had these great aspirations. Like, I was going to go in the military, I was going to run for politics, I was actually, I was going to try to be a senator at one point. And I was like, I'm going to do all these great things, I'm going to be like a great preacher, and like, like have a mega church and all that stuff. But I've been doing this 15 years now, it's my 10th year with OMF specifically. My life now is very different than what I thought it would be. I mostly like speaking at smaller churches. I mostly like working with kids. I mostly like working with those with special needs. One of the big ways I measure my life, and you guys are my friends, keep me accountable for this. You know something I'm really proud of? Is I'll get texts and I'll get messages at night, phone calls at night, from people with autism, from people who are orphans, or my friends who's, who's blind in a wheelchair, and they'll text me and comment like, hey David, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this thing, I need your help. One of my friends in a wheelchair, he's like, hey, I wanna do this bodybuilding show, but they don't have wheelchair lifts at a lot of the venues. Can you talk to the league president and make sure they have it? So essentially, I'm a servant. <laughs> All right, I'm captain of Team USA. Essentially, I'm a servant. Good. Jesus himself, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you know, you know how you know you're walking with God humbly? the more people you serve. When the people you serve are poor and poor, the people you serve are more and more broken, that they're going through more and more stuff in their life. And that takes a lot of humility, because we don't, we don't, write, that, we don't write about that in magazines, that doesn't look good on Instagram, right? We don't make movies about those kind of people, because it's not an impressive looking. As an athlete, I'm not gonna be at ESPN for that. <laughs> like, breaking news, David Pat got this guy a wheelchair lift at his next show. So we're going to David's house right now. What is David going to say about his wheelchair lift? Well, I made a phone call and then they brought the lift in. That's all, ESPN. <laughs> right? That's not exciting. Don't report out stuff like that. 
It's okay. That's okay. One of the things that I'm proud of now, and I'm going to share with you guys outside. I do kids' books now. All right. I, I went to a seminary, paid a bunch of money so that I can learn how to do kids' books. <laughs> Here's why. We have a lot of stories of successful people. We have a lot of stories about um, how to raise your kids to be great. I have so, so many of you, I'm part of this too, all right, have books of like, how to make your kids super smart, how to make your kids successful, and all that stuff, right? Like, those are the best selling parents' books. You know what bothers me? Is when I look at the books that Jeremiah and I have, you know, a lot more gifts and stuff. None of the characters are missing a parent. All right, a lot of the books, all the, all the babies and kids have both parents. And they have the grandparents and everything in the book. Right? Um, most of the books don't have special needs kids. Right? Most of, the, most of the kids are like strong and healthy and smart and all that stuff. And the books about how smart they are, how good they are at dancing and singing and stuff like that. <clears throat> and one thing I want for my son Jeremiah is to consider. To consider that there's other families out there. So this, this is a book about adoption. It's about a lamb who's adopted by a family of lions. Um, so he's a lamb with a lion heart. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and he has a disability. And the book's not mainly about his disability. It's about some of the challenges. But I wanted to kind of t tell these stories. Because I, I think about my friends with disabilities. I think about my friends who are adopted. And I wanted to tell their story. I hope that <clears throat> the people in this church, that you start thinking about some of the things that you experience in your own life, some of the injustices that you see, some of the broken, broken things that you see in your life, and you ask, what can I do? And don't judge it by achievement and judge it by like what's financially savvy and all that stuff. Right? But let's, let's judge it by how God sees it. The, the foolish things of the world. I'm, I'm challenged all the time, you know. Um, I'm challenged all the time to, to think about my own ministry, like how do I make it bigger, how do I make it better, and all that stuff. And I realize, like, you know what, that's not what I really care about. Like, I'm actually seriously most happy when I'm just, I came out with a small group of, like, special needs and orphans, and it has to be small enough, because too many special needs in one room is too, too much effort, but too many wheelchairs and stuff. And I'm like, you know what, I'm okay with that. Um, I invite you guys, I will be going to Shanghai in December of this year, 26 through 31. And one of the things I've learned from, the, from Budapest is <clears throat> the work of missions and the work of serving those with special needs, it cannot just be done by, done by Americans. There are too many Americans in this world. The, Chine the Chinese especially have to change. So when we go on this trip, I need Mandarin speakers because we're mostly going to work with Chinese orphanages and the Chinese church. And my hope with Jeremiah Lionheart, too, is to encourage them to reach out to those with special needs. Because reality is like, it's mostly Americans adopting Chinese babies. That, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be mostly Americans adopting Chinese babies. It should be Chinese adopting Chinese, right? Like, they're right next to you. You don't have all these hoops to jump through. And as a missionary, this is how it's related to the church. What do you want your church to look like? Do you want your church just to be smart and successful and super, and super talented? Or is God's church better served when some of us are adopted, when some of us are special needs? That's what I want to do, that's what I want to do for the Chinese church when I get there this winter. I invite you guys, all right? Through your prayer, through your support, through your guys going, we can change the world. In every generation, God challenges us to do this. God challenges us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. I hope as a church we can lift our plans to God and say, change our plans, change my mind, change my resources, so that I, I put these resources where you want. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you. I thank you for everyone in this room. God, we're all gathered here because we want to hear your voice. We want to worship you. We want our hearts to be changed. Lord, we want to invite your Holy Spirit to be here. God, renew us, empower us, give us hope in a direction so that every day we can experience your love and your mercy and your goodness to us. Be here now.
Amen. Amen. Well, as we move